Before we start, uh, I should say that this uh, session uh, is devoted to the memory of the late Jonathan Fine, uh, the former senior researcher at ICT, who died suddenly in Australia uh, during a lecture tour of the Far East. Uh, and to speak about him, uh, I'm pleased to, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Lisa Saban, who is here. Good afternoon. Uh, hi, Mickey. He's the son of uh, Jonathan Fine. Although a year passed, we are still mourning the sudden death of our dear colleague and friend, Dr. Jonathan Fine Zal. Dr. Jonathan Fine was a faculty member at the Lauda School of Government and the academic advisor of students. He was one of the most popular teachers among students. He shared with them his enthusiasm and his devotion to learning and knowledge. Dr. Fine was a senior researcher at the in International Institute for Counterterrorism, the ICT. He held the ICT efforts to better understand the unique manner in which fundamental religious groups engage in politics and use violence in order to achieve their goals from, uh, from a comparative global perspective. He served in the, in the IDF counter-terrorist un, unit and was a, an advisor on arms control to the IDF strategic division planning branch. He gave lectures to government agencies, staffers, military institutes, and law enforcement agencies in Israel and abroad, including IDF elite units, Navy, and Air Force as well. As a leading, a leading a scholar, Dr. Fine specialized in religion, fundamentalism, and political violence, with special emphasis on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. He also had a deep interest in the Middle Eastern and Israeli studies, with special emphasis on US and EU policies in the region. In this framework, Jonathan published two books, The Birth of a State, the establishment of the Israeli government system in 2009, and recently, political violence in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, from holy war to modern terror. I feel honored to have spent time with a distinguished scholar and a closer friend, and most of all, he was a remarkable person. Jonathan will always be in our memory. Thank you. I will introduce uh, each panelist uh, when I call them up to speak, uh, but you have their full uh, biographies on the, uh, the website uh, of uh, ICT, uh, and they were also in the program. Um, the focus of this workshop is on the different ways that radicals might be turned away from violence and terrorism. My introductory comments apply mostly to de-radicalization of potential jihadi terrorists in Europe, particularly Western Europe, but the panelists will examine other areas. It's clear that there are different pathways, that what may work in Saudi Arabia won't work in Turkey, and what works in Malaysia won't work in the UK. A few years ago, Shiraz Maher discussed Saudi camps for re-educating radicals with very mixed successes reinforcing for edu uh, re-education programs with financial inducements. Last year, in this panel, Rowan Gunaratna discussed agricultural reskilling, reinforced by government provision of small-scale farms in Malaysia for former terrorists. Magnus Ransdorp discussed the very successful uh, Copenhagen and Aarhus initiatives in Denmark, which involved prior security screening trauma counseling where required, followed by intensive social welfare, education, and employment assistance. And a few years ago, Sheikh Musa Admani, son of one of the founders of the Tablig Jamat, described the successful intensive cult busting techniques which he has pioneered to break down radical skewed understanding of Islam a UK initiative funded by the Office for Security and Counterterrorism. In France, 
Prime Minister recently announced plans to establish regional de-radicalization centers. Radicalizers and the catalyst for radicalization change, of course. In Europe in the 1990s, the primary radicalizers were Afghan and Balkan war veterans. Then it was exiled Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda veterans. And then it was the online communities with self-radicalizing tendencies and self-reinforcement mechanisms. Mark Sageman's Gang of Guys, which again he described to us some 12 years ago, played a big part in facilitating radicalization at that time. It's apparent, therefore, that there's no single template for radicalization. Grievances and ideals play an important part. Past involvement in gang violence, low-level crime is sometimes a linking factor, as is the allure, and we shouldn't underestimate it, of being part of a new caliphate. The director of a British Muslim interfaith group noted that some radicals feel they cannot flourish in an environment like the UK. Being part of ISIS and the new caliphate gives them a sense of belonging and a mission. Radicalization may involve a reaction to the perceived war against Islam, but the processes that by which people become radicalized often involve brainwashing and cult-like indoctrination. Prisons provide an arena for radicalization. Ian Acheson's recent report for the British government argued that without a coherent strategy for dealing with the Islamist extremism and recruitment in prisons, coupled with a complacent lack of understanding of the risks uh, of Muslim gang culture, allows the radicalization of moderate Muslims and even uh, the conversion of non-Muslims to radicalized Islam in prisons. He argued for the need to isolate Islamist prisoners, as Israel has been doing, and for better understanding of the role of prison chaplains and the necessity of preventing the circulation of jihadi literature in prisons. According to a recent British police report, up to half of those persuaded to volunteer for ISIS, and I assume they referred to the UK, have mental health vulnerabilities. Now the internet has superseded the real world as a gathering place for militants, and extremists and potential extremists are able to talk directly to Daesh in web forums and on social media. We now know that radicalizing militants cut themselves off for those who don't share their beliefs. Some do so slowly, as we heard, others comparatively quickly. The recent UK parliamentary report on radicalization notes the phenomenal role of the internet in radicalizing, providing command and control and communication capacities. And it castigates the main social networks for only paying lip service to their social responsibilities. And this is something that, if you've been reading the papers in the last few days, uh, Israel has taken up in a very serious manner uh, with some of the social networks. The effectiveness of counter-messaging is still inadequately explored, measured or assessed. Google-funded research by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, a London-based think tank, offers some hope. Part of the project has now been spun off to separate projects by a group calling themselves Moonshot. One of their projects involves non-ideological messaging as their initial research indicated that in ideology comes into the radicalization process really rather late. And again, as we heard this morning, and that the initial pathways to radicalization are more varied and frequently just not ideological. The process, or the project, sorry, will focus on careers, families, relationships of vulnerable groups. Another project has employed former radicals to engage people who exhibited radical tendencies via social media and in other ways. This mirrors the one-to-one -one radicalization methods employed by the radicalizers themselves. <coughs> the UK Prevent De-Radicalization Strategy, uh, which uh, the Commander of Counterterrorism Command spoke about yesterday in the plenary session, and its associated channel program through which the public can report suspicions about people they believe to have been radicalized has a mixed reputation. The government and police both view them to have been successful, but there is stark criticism from Muslim communities and the UK's independent review of terrorism legislation. 
Muslim groups accuse the government of spying on them and demonizing whole communities that prevent lacks any engagement at community level and only engages with those who think like the government, and that Muslims are viewed only through the prism of counter-terrorism. So, all the evidence shows that there's no single path or one single event which draws people into radicalization. Every case is different. Identifying people at risk is challenging and broad brush approaches which fail to take account of the complexities can be counterproductive and fuel the extremist narrative rather than challenging it. With that, by way of an introduction, uh, I'd like to call on Professor Alex Schmidt as our first speaker. He's currently the research fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism in The Hague and editor of Perspectives on Terrorism. And he will present to us a theoretical framework for de-radicalization. Good afternoon. Uh, challenging de-radicalization by rethinking radicalization is the topic. The idea is that a problem well defined is a problem half solved. And I'm not sure that uh, we have defined de radicalization well. In fact, uh, how did I get to the next one? Do you have a. Oh, in this one, okay. Sorry. I did a little literature study on radicalization, de-radicalization, and counter-radicalization, and the different authors uh, had different takes what it actually means. And you see the spectrum uh, goes uh, into more than uh, 20, partly admittedly, I overlapping interpretation what uh, is going on before the bomb goes off. and. Uh, the reverse uh, process. There are more than 30 de-radicalization programs in the world. And uh, like with prevention programs, it's difficult to tell whether they work. We don't really have a theory of de-radicalization, though Daniel Köhler comes out with a book uh, where one section is called Theory. And I just uh, <coughs> take the core of that theory. This is saying that nothing is practical I as a good theory, but in fact, this approach, uh, pluralization, depluralization, uh, to me is a framework uh, probably short of uh, theory. I'm going in the wrong direction. The term comes really from politics uh, after the Atocha attacks and then especially after the London attacks, the European policy establishment uh, was eager to get a grip on what they called violent radicalization. They created a commission, I was part of it. They never published a report because their findings uh, were not uh, liked by them, and uh, out of that came in the terrorism industrial complex run uh, association of 2,400 or so professionals, academics, social workers that deal with uh, de-radicalization in Europe. The next meeting of this organization is on the 3rd of October in Amsterdam. But they basically take the concept as offered by them by the politicians rather than questioning the concept itself. The concept, however, has been questioned. Uh, and here are just three critics that uh, raise doubts. One of the first researchers in this field, next to Tore Björgo, was uh, John Horgan, who said, we are stuck with radicalization. And 
So uh, if this is a deeply flawed concept, as he thinks, and he's one of the foremost uh, researchers, then uh, by definition, uh, de-radicalization is also not um, uh, problematic. I myself uh, see three major problems. Uh, one is, as a former radical, I say that, Trotskyist, the association of radicalization with radicalism uh, rather than extremism is, in my view, flawed. Uh, also, that radicalization takes place only on one side of a conflict uh, diet and not also on the other is questionable. I mean, how would the 200 years of American democracy g would go out and kidnap people abroad, torture people abroad, assassinate people abroad? That is a process of radicalization also on the side of governments. And then radicalization focuses on the vulnerable individual rather than on other formations. I don't think you can blame every uh, kid in Gaza for being uh, radicalized. It's the school system, it's the ecosystem, it's the ruling system that uh, pushes them in that way. And there is certainly also something on uh, the higher level. If you look at what were called the radicals in the 19th century, they were republicans rather than royalists. They were for gender equality. They were for the vote for all males, not just those propertied. They were anti-clerical. All these things that radicals at the edge of society wanted, they were somewhere between liberalism and socialism, have been achieved. So when you go back to uh, that definition of uh, the European Union saying that radicalism is there to undermine uh, democracy, if you look at the history of ideas, it is uh, a bit more complex. Uh, radicalism and extremism are quite different. So having studied the literature, uh, I tried to re conceptualize uh, radicalization in the sense that you see at the wall. The main element is that you move from one value system uh, to another and no longer recognize uh, the old one. And of course many of the old value system in today's world are outdated. As uh, Regis Debré said, we are never contemporaneous uh, to our present, so it is a privilege of youth to be radical, but not to be extremism. So radicalization is a concept that can be useful if we see it uh, in the terms that I uh, sketch here, but uh, Of course, we cannot change uh, the terminology easily, but what we really are worried about is extremism, and in particular, religious extremism. 70% uh, of all terrorist attacks come from a religious, mainly uh, Muslim, jihadist, Salafist background. And so, we have to focus on that. If you look at other forms of terrorism, single-issue terrorism, a term I created in the early 80s when I developed definitions and typologies in the field, or vigilante terrorism, you can be a vigilante without being radicalized but still become a terrorist pretty soon. Uh, but the problem is religious extremism as defined here. And to recognize what religious extremism is, and here this is a bit broader, I uh, studied the phenomenon and developed a description of 20 uh, manifestations of extremism. I cannot go and discuss them all without uh, taking away time from uh, the other speakers, but such a checklist is useful uh, to see what you have. If you want to talk to prisoners who want to appear rehabilitated, you can use such a checklist in uh, probation discussions with them. 
Now, if you look at the de-radicalization programs that are around in the world, uh, basically started with prisoner programs, there have been more than 100,000 people put behind bars. And many of them never have seen the privilege of a trial in certain countries. And after a while, one wants to see whether they changed. Rehabilitation is uh, the name of the game in prisons, at least in the light of uh, the Beccaria and the Enlightenment. So there are different programs on various levels meant for in prison or out of prison de-radicalization, individual uh, de-radicalization or uh, collective de-radicalization as they have been attempted, for instance, in Egypt, but also in other countries. Now, the objectives for uh, de-radicalization programs uh, are quite varied. And you see here a list uh, developed by John Horgan and uh, Tore Abjurgo. And depending on what your goal is, primary goal is, uh, you will make them different. Acquiring intelligence is uh, one goal, but it can stand in the way of some other goals because they have to betray their former uh, colleagues, for instance. Then there are a number of uh, tools uh, that are used, uh, for instance, uh, using religious figures to bring them back to the true religion. The problem with true religion is that there are 4,200 religions, cults, and sects in the world all claiming to be in possession of uh, exclusive truth. In other words, they are all wrong in the light of each other. So, uh, but that's an approach that is widely used in Muslim countries. They think, the government thinks, we have the right religion, Islam is a religion of peace, so we bring them back. In Western countries, we try to bring them back to the community uh, which is like civil society, one of those uh, fabulous social constructs uh, that uh, might exist in some uh, societies stronger than in others. Uh, so depending on what end state you want these people to end with. Now, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London has been mentioned, and they are at the forefront of uh, such uh, programs. And they came up with a number of uh, common wisdoms, findings about what works, what doesn't work. And you see here a list. The thing is, these lists look plausible, but the moment you start t testing them empirically, then it goes like sand in your hands. A uh, start at the University of Maryland has uh, looked at almost 200 claims on things that work in counterterrorism and looked then at the statistical and the qualitative evidence and graded these recommendations that come out of uh, meetings like this one in terms of how much empirical support they have on a scale from one low support or no support to nine. And uh, out of the 10 recommendations uh, or 10 tests they did with uh, a de-radicalization hypothesis, only five uh, reached uh, uh, grade five and only one uh, five or higher, and only one, the last one, uh, came up with a higher score. So the carrot is better than the stick, basically. Uh, that's what it uh, says. Now, the topic here is pathways to de-radicalization. And uh, Given that there are about 50 ways of radicalization, that's how many on Speckhardt, who spoke to close to 500 terrorists and their families, uh, came up with a list of that. There are many ways 
out depending whether you are a leader or a follower at what stage you are but uh, my take on pathways out comes with these five avenues that are worth exploring one is uh, the concept of ichihat do i pronounce that correctly yes which has been uh, recommended uh, by our colleague who will follow me uh, as speaker here. I will not go into that because she knows more about that and I could say something wrong, which I will not do. But uh, personally, uh, I am uh, very much in favor of teaching children religion in a comparative way. If you put just a five, six world religion next to each other and look at the do's and don'ts, how much uh, hell, uh, how long hell you get for sins and so. That is, I think, a little step towards critical thinking. Another is, look at the logical contradictions within uh, religion. So it was, for instance, a Danish rocker who turned to Islam and became uh, an advisor to Ablaki also tried to, I uh, was asked to bring him a Croatian blonde as a bride. And one day, uh, Morton Storm googled contradictions in the Quran, and he came up with 182, I think, and next morning uh, he was no longer a Muslim. So maybe that is uh, one way to do it. But teaching critical thinking is difficult. I'm teaching uh, at university level, master and PhD students, and believe me, critical thinking is uh, the exception rather than uh, the rule. They want to know what the teacher thinks is right, and then they want to be rather close to that rather than challenging the teacher. Another method that I found useful and which I worked out in a ICCT paper where I tried to go against the, ICC, uh, the ideology of uh, Daesh, uh, compare what, uh, thank you, what's in their saying and in what's in their doing. And this uh, say-do gap is rather big. They ask kids uh, to go and blow themselves up, but send their kids to a public school in England for education, and so on. The last model uh, is the so-called good lives model. The idea here is that we all try to become president of the United States or uh, anchor woman or whatever. We have dreams of what we want to uh, be. And if we can't realize those dreams with legal means by working hard, studying hard, and so on, we try to take shortcuts to happiness. One shortcut is taking drugs, creating these artificial terrorizers. Another shortcut is get rich uh, by criminal means, and so on. So we all have these uh, desires and dreams. And if you give people tools to do that in a pro-social way, or at least in a non-harmful way, you can work with their ambitions and with their strength and redirect them. And that, I think, is an approach uh, worth uh, looking for. My time is up, but I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Schmidt. Um, let me just say that we were supposed to have been five people here. Uh, Matthew Di Michele, uh, who works for the Center for Justice, Safety, and Resilience uh, in California, um, should have been here, but he was prevented from coming. His presentation on how violent right-wing extremists leave racist groups in the USA uh, is available if anybody wants his uh, presentation, uh, we have it uh, and we can forward it to you uh, if you ask us later on. Um, I'd now like to call uh, on our second speaker, uh, Rahil Reza, 
uh, who is the president of the Council of Muslims Facing Tomorrow in Canada, uh, who will talk about the identification of those being radicalized and how to counter their efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Um, you have all spent uh, two and a half days uh, hearing from scholars, academics, and uh, experts about radicalization. Uh, my focus is on radical Islam, uh, which has led to a global jihadist insurgency. And uh, whether we like it or not, it can't be ignored, which is to say that we may ignore it, but it won't ignore us. So let me um, uh, speak to you from a very grassroots and simplistic perspective. Uh, these are some of the types of radicalization that we have found, albeit they're not all, and I appreciate the previous speaker mentioning that there are many different as aspects to de-radicalization. There are those radicals who want to join ISIS and become jihadists to kill people. Uh, there are radicals now who are women and children, and we saw this in the San Bernardino, San Bernardino uh, case, we saw in Turkey children being used. Uh, this is a, a new phenomena. Uh, it means that the extremists, that the jihadists are willing to use any means to reach their goals. Um, the reluctant radical, someone who is brainwashed by friends or acquaintances, is sort of borderline, not quite sure whether he's there or, or, or not. Uh, radicals who search dark areas of the internet and are waiting for someone to bring them in, into the circle. Radicals with a cause, that is, they have grievances both real and imagined. Uh, they have probably dealt with bigotry and racism in their lives, and the person and the book that I can uh, uh, suggest to you on that is a book by uh, Majid Nawaz. It's called Radical Majid Nawaz of the Quilliam Foundation, who is well known internationally now, was a member of the Hizb tahrir which is a very radical organization. And in that, you can understand very clearly uh, how a young man born and brought up in England could have been radicalized, and then he de-radicalized himself, now spends his time traveling and speaking about his ex experiences. Radicals without a cause, who have simply been taught to hate. Uh, this, again, is a gentleman by the name of Tawfiq Hamid, an Egyptian who was very subtly brought into the radical ideology. His book is called Inside Jihad, and in fact, I have referenced much, uh, a lot of my uh, notes today from his work on both the radicalization process and the de-radicalization process. So those who have been inside, those who have been radicalized, those who have been jihadists, are probably the best people to tell us how de-radicalization can take place. And last but not the least are radicals who are the result of civilization, jihad. Many of them come from the left. They are soft Islamists. They put on a moderate face, but are actually dangerous. So I would suggest to my colleague here that we need to discuss the term moderate before you can start using it for me. There are radicals in Muslim countries for whom Radicalization is a breeze. It's just like joining an academy or a college or a school. The resources are all there for them. But in Western countries, radicals have to find allies. And this is becoming easier and easier for them as we see political correctness grow on one side. And on the other side, the fact that the regressive left refuses to call the problem what it is. They're in denial. They refuse to see what's right in front of them. And living in the West as a Muslim, as, as a pro progressive, liberal, anti-terrorist Muslim, this is what our experience has been in the last 10 years. One thing that all these radicals have in common is that they want to instill maximum harm and that they have declared a war on the West. And these are not my words, but what they have very clearly said. And this is a disease which has many contagious areas, some of which are how they then work on fellow radicals, on spouses, on children, on youth in the areas uh, that they know them. 
we have radical messaging coming from some mosques and from Islamic organizations. Uh, converts, in, in, and I know that the later speakers are going to uh, focus on this, in prisons. We also have a study that was done by a member of our board on the conversion in American prisons of the black community. And this is done because the Saudis have now got an agreement where they are allowed to put chaplains in prisons, and these chaplains are instilling the Wahhabi ideology in the minds of those uh, people who convert because they already have a built-in angst against the status quo, against the system, against the government. And that is where these grievances come, in, come into play. Some are real, some are imagined, but they are little firecrackers that can be used to instill radicalization. Um, hate that is taught at a young age, that has been mentioned, a very, very important factor in the realization that nobody is born a radical. They don't suddenly wake up one morning and say, aha, I'm going to go out and shoot 10 people. It's a process. They are taught. And very often our law enforcement is not able to connect the dots between who is radicalizing and converting those people. And that is an, a very important factor. In the work that we do with law enforcement police when we train them, we remind them that you need to go to the, to, to the source. You need to find out who has radicalized these young people because that is where the core is. And once we've identified the virus, I mean, this is some, but something a doctor has said. It is a virus. It is a disease. It needs to be isolated, and it needs to be uh, cured. There has to be a cure for it. And this is the biggest challenge. Uh, those of us who are reformist Muslims know this is where the problem lies. We know what the solutions are to some extent. And trying to convince our policymakers, our law enforcement is very, very difficult. And one of the weaknesses of the West was the fact in their error of thinking that the jihadists are barbaric, uncivilized, uneducated, working out of a cave in Tora Bora. Not so. In the last 35 years, Probably I could pinpoint the year, the date, the time when I left Pakistan. This was when Wahhabi ideology, Wahhabi Salafi ideology was being instilled into Pakistan. Saudi Arabia was flexing its muscle. And this has been going on for 35 years. So there is an entire generation of young people who have already been brainwashed into this ideology. And we have been sitting back thinking, you know, they don't have the technology. What they don't have, they can buy because they have billions of petrodollars at their disposal. So trust me, they know more about how you think and about how you tick and what buttons to press and who to use than we could ever imagine. So, uh, you know, there, on the one side, of course, there is uh, this error in thinking. And on the other side, we have naive bordering on ignorant, if you'll excuse my terminology, uh, lawmakers. Canadian Public Safety Minister just recently gave a statement saying, and I quote, we need to understand that positive messages can counteract the poison. And he's not the only one. There are others who think that if you sit around a table with ISIS, share latkes and samosas, and have this warm, fuzzy conversation, you know, tell me what your problems are, and I'll tell you my problems, everything will be wonderful. I mean, our wonderful prime minister, who I truly love and respect, had thought that by sending blankets to ISIS in winter, they could solve the problem. I, I mean, I'm not even an expert in technology or counterterrorism. Even I know that that doesn't work. They're sitting with a gun at our heads. Their ideology is to destroy us, and you want to have a conversation with them? We know from failed efforts that neither a predominantly military approach nor a totally political correct approach has succeeded in solving the problem. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here having, having these conversations, because these uh, approaches don't take into account that terrorism is only a byproduct of radicalization. And in order to eradicate radicalization, we have to go to the root cause, like a root canal, which is very painful. I have had one, so I can tell you it's something you never wish on anyone. But we have to pull out the diseased part. That is the only solution. Today, the Muslim world wherever it is, and I say this as a generalization, 
1.6 billion Muslims largely are influenced by only three ideologies. And I say today because this was not the case when I was growing up as a Muslim. This last 35 years, what these uh, extremists have succeeded in doing, the three ideologies, it is either the Muslim Brotherhood, which you know, it is uh, Khomeiniism for the Shias, and the Salafi Wahhabi ideology for the majority Sunnis. Uh, I sometimes have to stand up before I give a talk and say I'm a Sunni Muslim, and I can tell you it's one of the most difficult things to do these days. You don't really identify yourself because that is where the majority of the problem lies. But how can we fight this? We can negate all those ideologies that are against human rights. We have a project in our organization, very simple, as I said, very grassroots. Name them and shame them. Someone said to us, social media is very important. Use social media so that young people who are looking at the actions of the jihadists can see how gory they are, see how cruel they are. So name them and shame them every time they do something. Very important to avoid political correctness. I can't stress that enough. Political co correctness has been the death of any kind of activism and action towards solutions. And it's important to get the facts. So in this regard, I refer you to a fantastic, short, 14-minute crisp documentary. It's called By the Numbers. It has been made by the Clarion Project, and it gives you all the statistics. It is. Um, it, it, it's something that, that you can't ignore. I don't, I'll take more than two minutes because he did too. <laughs> so uh, I'll speak fast. So this is what we need to do. We need to t teach young Muslims to embrace life over death. That is the work that has to be done within the Muslim communities. So the work of counterterrorism is not just to be done on the level of experts and technology. It has to be done from within the Muslim communities. I said this yesterday. And it has to be done with support from the larger communities on the, on the outside. We have to keep a strict eye on the financing, the financing of institutions. There was a report in the Washington Post about five years ago that said that 80% of the mosques in the United States were funded by Wahhabi's uh, uh, money. So obviously, if you know that the funding is coming from there, what kind of messaging? We have done this in Canada. We have pointed out the financing of some of the Islamist organizations, and the charitable status was removed because the funding was found to be coming from suspicious sources. So any kind of funding needs to be checked, the funding that is coming in and the funding that is going out. So countries who are being given massive amounts of funding to fight terrorism need to to have accountability. My own land of birth, Pakistan, takes billions of dollars in funding to say they are fighting terrorists, but they are keeping the terrorists alive because they need to have that there to get the funding. They found the perfect solution. They are the ones who are supporting terrorism because that's how they keep on getting the funding. And of course, I cannot stress enough the importance of working with reform-minded Muslims, because we are the frontline warriors in this battle against radical jihadist Islam. We are the ones who can look at the text, the scriptures, we can quote back to them. We need both theology and social issues in which to fight back. Quilliam Foundation in the United Kingdom is doing an amazing job in creating a counter theology for the ISIS narrative. And this, this is the work that has to be done uh, within. So the vi this vision is not limited to, to just the overt savagery, savagery wrought on Muslims and non-Muslim, but it also includes the murky Islamist political efforts of the Muslim Brotherhood. And I'm going to give you just one quote of the Muslim Brotherhood to let you know that they are the most dangerous. And they say, and I quote, destroying Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by the hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and God's religion is made victorious over all other religions. Quick question, do we think that the West does enough to diffuse radicalization and prevent its nationals from traveling to join failing states, to join extremists? The answer is obvious. Amarnath Amarasingham, one of Canada's leading researchers on ISIL recruitment, says that it is the, the romanticization of the new caliphate that attracts young people to, to go and join them. So we have to de-romanticize this notion. We have to make it really uh, negative for young people to go and join ISIL. And the parents of these um, 
uh, young people who have gone are willing to join our ranks and work with us. And very quickly, um, two points before I finish and before my time is up. One is that we have found that in terms of the grievances, a community which we have ignored, which is being radicalized very fast by the Islamists, is the native Aboriginal community. This has happened in Australia, it's happening in Canada, and it's happening in the United States, but for some reason, we are not keeping an eye on this. This is because, as I said again, they already have a built-in angst and anger against what they consider the white people who have grieved them. And so they are happy to convert never to spiritual Islam, but to radical Islam. And we do have uh, some good news as well. Our organization works on a project in Bangladesh. And again, a very grassroots project which costs us $50 a month. And in the last year, with the help of young people on the ground, many of whom were arrested, tortured, and so on, they have managed to de-radicalize 20 villages in Bangladesh. 80 more are targeted, and trust me, this is done to people who are not educated, they are not literate. We use videos that have been made in, Bang in the Bangladesh language. One of our board members is from Bangladesh. He uses concepts of Sharia and through a docudrama, debunks the idea that the Imam knows everything and that he is the one who is divinely appointed. And as a result, in one village, the women threw the Imam out and said, we will find our own way to understand the religion and they put a banner at the gate at the head of the village saying de-radicalized village. So if we can do it in a village in Bangladesh, we can certainly do it in the West. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Um, our next speaker uh, is Lieutenant General Retired Orit Adato, the former commander of the Israeli Prison Service. Uh, she will talk to us on de-radicalization in prisons, a general framework. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Orit Adato. Yes, I've been the Commissioner of Prisons uh, in Israel. And before that, I've been a general in the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, I found myself as a commissioner in prisons. I'm going to be a little bit the naughty girl in this uh, uh, workshop because I'm going to begin with a question, end with a question. And in between, I'm, I will do my best to make this question mark bigger and bigger for you to think about what's happening, what might happen, what is probably the way to deal with yes or no. And the, uh, that's why I chose the uh, title of de-radicalization in prison. Is it a possible process? Let's see. Which one? Ah, that's good. Okay. Um, I would say radicalization process or and their radicalization process, because both of them are playing at the same way, at the same facilities. I'm talking about prisons. I'm not talking about society outside. I'm talking about prisons and the influence the prisons or the prisoners has uh, outside of prisons. I will try to focus on one, let's say, short, little, not a big dilemma that it is worldwide nowadays. How do we house these suspected, convicted, on their way to be convicted inmates regarding terror? Uh, should we separate them? Should we integrate them among penal inmates? What's the right way to deal with them? So, We'll look at the separate housing and the integrated housing, housing. I will be looking to the risks and odds. Let's begin with the risk, of course. While we are keeping them separated from other, meaning, and I'm talking about um, not only, mostly about the Israeli experience, but not only, because I have a global uh, experience uh, acting for nine years as the vice president of the International Correction and Prison Association and working in different countries uh, regarding the issue. 
First of all, uh, and I'm speaking about the Israeli experience, think about the fact that we are dealing with thousands of them. It's not that you have few dozens or even few hundreds. At my time during three, three years, about three years, uh, during the second intifada, what was called, the number grew up from about 600 to almost 4,000. So keeping them all together meaning you are treating them all the same. And it means that you put what I say, I call the mega terrorist, the extremers, with the light terrorists at the, at the same time. I will get back a little bit and say, I've been asked several times, what is really the differences between organized crime, gangs, and terrorists? Bad guys are always bad guys. They recruit bad guys, they operate bad guys. What's the real difference? And I say, yes, there are some similarities, but there are three main differences. The first is uh, the goal. For organized crime gang, the goal is business. For the terrorist, it's ideology, theology, whatever, but it is totally different sphere. The second difference that derived from the, f the first one is the time frame. You know, the organized crime gang members, leaders, whatever, wants to have the benefits here and now for them, for their families, friends, colleagues, whatever. There is a quotation in Arabic says, El Ajil min shitan, meaning being in a hurry or rushing belong to the Satan. It means I have the whole time in the world. It won't happen at my time, at my generation, my son or daughter, grandson, grand, grand, grandson, the time frame is totally different. And the third different, especially in prison, is the fact that organized crime gang members can be identified by the intelligence or anyway, by their tattoos, by their behavior, they are involved in any crime. No, nothing is not okay for them to be involved in. While these inmates on the surface are quiet, clean, disciplined, they are doing mostly all the time what they are being told in a way, but below surface things are happening. They are not using drugs, nor alcohol, no sex among themselves. They, for the uh, warden, sometimes he look at them and uh, they look like good uh, inmates but below surface things are uh, happening. So getting back to the separate housing, uh, so if they are being kept together, they can influence on each other. They can only also radicalize and extreme influence inside prison upon what I call small fishes or light terrorists. When you keep them all together, it happens to be that there will be the mega terrorists and there will be some small fishes, those that has been paid $100 to do something, to, to take a paper from point A to point B. He didn't know what was before. He didn't know what's going to happen afterwards. But at the end of the day, it was uh, uh, part of a process, of a terror activity process. And then he is in prison as a terrorist. And that is the option for them to influence. Uh, indoctrination, all what we know, building and shaping new generation of the terrorists, because those that has been convicted for few years and they will be released during their time in prison, they are radicalized when they come out, they will be more radicalized. They might be more radicalized. We have the experience of the release uh, upon the exchange with the uh, POW that we had in uh, Gaza, and we have released about 1,500 terrorists to get him back alive uh, home. Uh, very much, I would say, a large number of these uh, that has been released after five, six years returned. Um, when you keep them all together, there is no hope. They are all terrorists. They have nothing to lose. That's something that has to be taken into consideration. 
uh, negative influence in the Israeli uh, experience, it's on the Palestinian street, because you, you, you can imagine, when I'm, I'm talking about thousands, it means that any family in the West Bank or in Gaza had in the past, have now, or will have some representative in the prisons. So they are being grown, the children, we've talked about before, being grown in a hatred uh, environment, atmosphere, uh, and they can uh, join later on also to become an, a terrorist. So, uh, and in Europe, for example, it, they have an influence on the Muslim community, frustration, hatred, whatever uh, is being done. Terror inmates uh, issue in our uh, in our uh, experience in Israel, and it has in the past, in uh, England as well, uh, th this issue is a significant component in any political process. I don't have time to discuss, to elaborate a little bit about it, but there will be no arrangement with the Palestinians without, cons without considering what will happen with these terror inmates. Okay, what are the risks of integrated housing, putting them with penal inmates? Negative influence, of course, upon pen penal inmates. Uh, on the surface, as I said before, bef uh, versus below surface behavior and activity. Uh, utilizing vulnerable inmates. And we talked about vulnerability. Who is being radicalized? Who is vulnerable and uh, needs some support? Radicalization and extremism process among penal inmates indoctrination and recruits. And these that has been recruited in prison, and we have heard lately, for the last 10 years I'm speaking on, on every stage that I can, there is a recruitment in prisons. Prison is a recruitment pool. At the beginning people were looking at me worldwide, uh, what she's talking about. Nowadays, at least we know that it does happen. The process, just to share with you. Uh, and in the morning we discussed uh, the issue of uh, on Africa, is it the, the next possibility for the uh, jihadists? So let's look about a penal offender that coming for the first time to prison. He's a first timer, mostly vulnerable one. He doesn't have any group, any gang, any. And I'm, I will be not politically correct, and I would say Afro-Americans or Afro-origin Europeans in prisons are the most vulnerable groups, or not groups, people. So it begins with, his, he comes over there, he looks for company, he's, look for, he's looking for support. You know, um, you don't know, and you, I hope you will not know, what it means to be a prisoner, first-timer in a prison. It's not so nice environment to live in. So you are looking for someone to uh, guard you, to be part of something. They are waiting for you there. Friendship, company, backing, grouping, don't worry, we are here. We, it's not, it doesn't mean that they are already considered as terror inmates. Some of them has committed uh, uh, deliberately petty crime to get into prison because they have a role to recruit in prison. The next phase will be participation in religious praise, and we have heard a little bit about the imams. I asked a colleague of mine in the US, never mind where in the States, and I asked him, do you have some uh, staff member sitting in the imam uh, uh, prayers or the imam classes? He said, of course. Does he understand the language? No. So what it means? Uh, the next phase is persuasion, temptation, or on the other side, threats and extortion, meaning you don't have enough money, we will as assist you in your, uh, what we call, a canteen account. On the other hand, your family has left outside, they, they need some support, we will take care of them. This is one side. The other side is your daughter is 12 years old and she studying in the school at that address, isn't she? Believe me, it's enough. He will do whatever he will be asked to. And then come the uh, 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 indoctrination sessions, I'll go over. Then come the test mission. And the test mission doesn't have to do anything with terror. It could be you just have to prove us that you are some of us, one of us. Meaning, uh, even if uh, you uh, an uh, assault on another inmate that doesn't have anything to do with it, just show us your commitment. Or 
ask your friend, son, daughter, cousin, whatever, to take a paper again from point A to point B outside. No one will know anything about it. We will know that you have done it. And then come the rewards, the support, the encouragement, and radicalization and recruitment. And then come, might be, the next terrorist, what we call lone wolves, what we call sleeping cells. It's part of it. Separate housing, the odds. And now I will share with you the Israeli potential of the radicalization process. I would say that even when we are having them all together, we can divide them into three, in general, okay, subgroups. One is the extremists, those that are radicalized, they believe ideological, theological, they will not change their mind, put them together. And on the other side, the, what I call the light terrorists, those that didn't know that they are terrorists. Or even if they did, they, were, they did it just from money reasons, for, for helping their families or whatever. In between these two groups, there is the middle group. They did, they knew what they have done, but they are looking to, they might be looking for the uh, two sides. They find different incarceration conditions to each group according to their dangerousness level, meaning classification, of course. The ex extremists will get the minimum requirement by the international uh, um, uh, conventions or Geneva conventions. The light terrorists will have potential vocational training, potential rehabilitation process, something to look for, to see we might be able to get out with more qualified to be a citizen, not to be a terrorist. And the middle group, they will look both sides and will have to decide whether they want to join the radical allies with their uh, incarceration uh, uh, conditions or they want to uh, de-radicalize and become and become uh, and, and see the light at the end of the tunnel over there. S that will minimize indoctrination and negative influence by the extreme earth within the light and even the medium groups that will increase potential for de-radicalization process among these light and maybe even medium group that I've been talking about. And it will prevent radicalization process and recruitment of penal inmates. Integrated housing, there are odds there as well. First of all, it's personal classification of terror inmates, each one by one. When you are talking about dozens, few hundreds, it works. When you are talking about thousands, I'm not sure it can be done. Intentional planned placement of each inmate. If you know, if you classify each one by one, you can uh, place him or her in a place that you can uh, control later on. Specific relevant programs, potential de-radicalization, there, there might be a, an opportunity, opportunity to de-radicalize those that were not so strong radicalized. I personally do not believe, I know them one by one. I know them, unfortunately, personally, some of them. Those that are really radicalized, some of them, it's irreversible process. You invest in what you think there will be odds to, to get there. You are not, you, you don't, as to my opinion, you don't invest in places that are, will not work. Professional monitoring of each inmate behavior. And then we got to the problem, because we have heard from security organization that outside, if they have a few hundreds inmates, uh, not inmates, civilians, it is very hard for them to monitor them outside, to supervise them outside. Some of those that has been committing the uh, terror attacks lately has been in these lists. Uh, so when you are talking about hundreds, it's not that easy to be done, especially when you are talking about more than hundreds. Um, the other way is to identify the vulnerable inmates, penal inmates that I spoke about before, and try to find for them different programs, to give them alternatives rather than being recruited by these extremists. So preventing radicalization process of these uh, uh, pe penal inmates, but it has to be with very tight monitoring on each of them. So you have to monitor the potential recruiters and you have to monitor the potential recruits. 
it means a lot of work to be done. So I'm looking at that and I'm asking a question. Is there a possibility for de-radicalization in prison? Is there a possibility? That, that has an, an answer. Of course, there are radicalization processes in prison all around the world, not in only here. What is the right solution, if at all? Separate housing, integrated housing, I, I promise you, I will, uh, uh, you will remain with more question mark than uh, uh, answers. So, as to my opinion, and I'm expressing myself, the first priority is preventing radicalization and recruitment. This is much more important. After you finish that, if at all, then you have the time and the sources, resources to, uh, for the second priority, trying to de-radicalize terror inmates. And as well, when you are doing that, try to emphasize on those that have a chance to de-radicalize. Don't make an effort to try to de-radicalize those that are already there and will not get back from that point. So it's a choice between two options. We have to choose rather to put our hand in the sand and say, yeah, we are going to do everything that, that will be, will solve the problem, or to put a projector on the prison, look very deep down on what's going on then, and try, first of all, to prevent radicalization, and then to try to de-radicalize the, these that are, um, these are, pos pos has the possibility to de-radicalize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, uh, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Sagit Yehoshua, um, who studied in London at uh, King's College where, uh, at the uh, ICSR, which uh, my agency has a very close association with who will talk about radicalization in the UK within prisons uh, and uh, uh, working with individuals. After Sagit has spoken, uh, we will take uh, a 10 minute coffee break and then reconvene and then the balance of the afternoon, uh, we can uh, pose questions uh, to each of the speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, it's always a privilege to be the last speaker uh, after such a long day. Uh, but I hope, uh, thank you, to be able to um, um, make you stay awake. Um, I've been dealing with the aspect of radicalization and um, understanding terrorist mindset in the last uh, more than 10 years, actually, 10 years actually. And it's fascinating to see the changes that we've uh, gone through uh, during the years, and uh, I believe ISIS, and I'm sure it's been talked about here um, extensively, uh, how ISIS have changed the scene, changed the profile of terrorism, changed the profile of terrorists. Um, even if we compare it to Al-Qaeda, we can see that it's very, very different um, the way we needed to handle uh, terrorism um, back then to the way we need to handle terrorism today. Um, in the UK, UK is a very interesting uh, example for an amazing change in the way um, UK's authorities uh, have been dealing with terrorism. Um, if we consider um, the IRA and the experience they have with the IRA and what they're experiencing today, it's a quiet adjustment, it's a quiet um, change in, in, in the policy, change in, the adjust in, in, in handling those uh, uh, prisoners and, um, and individuals, uh, foreign fighters today. So um, I appreciate the, the process that has been going on in the UK. They still have a lot to, <laughs> uh, to work on. Um, when I arrived to the UK in 2009 um, and had some conversations with um, figures from the prison and um, the attitude was totally different. Um, um, and, and I will talk about it um, oh. um, in my presentation. Well, just a little bit about the history so you can understand the process. Um, 
the what the UK has been dealt with was more um, um, the IRA. Uh, and again, we're not talking about um, um, lots of uh, prisoners in, in, in late years, but the maze uh, was a sort of a prison that assembled all these prisoners, and it wasn't a good example for, for the UK, and hence today they I mean, the process was that they didn't think that they should treat prisoners separately, um, those kinds of prisons separately than criminals. Um, because the Mays, uh, the sectarian jail, uh, was sort of, um, um, he was known as famous uh, for, like, as a university for terror. Um, uh, small terrorists become big terrorists, as uh, Orite just mentioned. Um, and um, it was famous for the hunger strike and 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 very famous escape of uh, 38 prisoners. Um, so the experience wasn't uh, very very good for them. It was closed in 1998 uh, after the Good Friday Agreement when it was no longer needed. Um, but since then, um, the idea, the policy was that uh, terrorists are criminals and you should treat them as such. And there was. There was um, they were dispersed in prison among other uh, criminals. They were treated the same, uh, which, um, according to our experience in Israel, was very very different. In Israel, they're very they're separated. Uh, they have different um, 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 way of handling them. And I was quite uh, surprised when I heard the way they are being handled. But if we consider. Um, the difference between the IRA terrorists to the Islamist or jihadist terrorists that we have today, then you can understand that you can understand the attitude because the IRA didn't have any support within prison. They weren't that influential in um, 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 recruiting other prisoners within prison. It happened, but it wasn't in a scale that we have today with jihadists, and, and I will elaborate on it in a second. Um, so I can understand why it worked that way, but it was very important in the UK to understand that the threat is different, and we need to adjust. We need to handle uh, the threat differently. And I can say that only these days we can see a bit of a change. It didn't happen uh, before, but um, in that sense, it's very important that the change will actually um, happen. Um, what I will talk about is two different uh, radicalization and de-radicalization process. Um, I will touch on a very uh, uh, latest, the latest report uh, um, uh, that relates to prisons that will show exactly how the changes in the policy and attitude among, um, among terrorists in prison and the handling of these terrorists. Um, it relates to the Ministry of Justice and NOMS, which is a National Offender Management Service and it was published in August 22nd, uh, 2016. I will touch on very um, few points. I'm not going to elaborate on all the reports, just the main points that I think that are important and that elaborates on this specific issue. Another um, um, thing that I will talk about uh, briefly is the foreign fighters uh, that came from the UK um, and the phenomena that relates to that. and and how that links to the radicalization aspect or disengagement um, in the UK. So um, the background that led to um, um, Islamic extremism and, and the change in policy in around prison is, of course, the increase of Islamist extremism since the 9-11. Um, as I say, th uh, said before, they treated like terrorist prisoners, uh, sorry, they treated like uh, provisional IRA prisoners, uh, dispersed among prisons, didn't in uh, integrated. Um, and then um, after the 7-7 um, incident, terrorist incidents in the UK, there were uh, enhanced legislation um, that passed that um, uh, leading to rise in TAC. TAC is um, uh, terrorist um, acts prisoners and IE, which is Islamic extremist prisoners. 
So again, rising um, jihadists in prison, rising uh, in, in, and I think I've heard that before from other colleagues, um, there's a, a dramatic rise of, uh, of, of Muslim prisoners in prisons, whether they are criminals or whether they are um, a, a, a jihadist, that's a risk, and a risk of radicalization, a risk of recruitment, and it's something that needs to be tackled. Um, identifying the threats. I mean, there are some other threats, but again, I um, identify the, the main ones. Um, first, relation to criminal activities. A lot of Muslim gang culture relates to other drugs and, and um, other uh, acts that you know, unify um, uh, Muslims in criminal activity, advocating support for Daesh and threats against staff and other prisoners, um, charismatic, i.e. prisoners acting as self-style emirs. Um, there's a lot of very charismatic um, um, jihadists that, you know, um, are able to speak very clearly and, you know, um, um, thrive other uh, Muslims to, um, uh, for, to the ideology, to the extreme ideology, uh, conversion of a lot of, I think it was mentioned before, um, to the Islam and uh, books and educational materials promoting extremist literature. This is another problem that there wasn't any um, uh, monitoring of this aspect and um, I think Ulrite uh, mentioned the fact that the language is a barrier and it's a problem and this something needs to be tackled. So again, it's a question that's been asked again, disperse or assemble, integrate them or disperse them and I'm, I'm happy to be, to be speaking after Ulrite because she definitely cleared that up uh, in that sense. But um, the UK, even until today, is still struggling with that, what to do whether to disperse them or assemble them or uh, integrate them. And uh, again, according to they, their experience with the IRA, there was no need of giving them this special treatment. Um, and it has its prawns and cones like we had. Um, but they realized that these prisoners need to be, you know, uh, uh, handled in a specific way that is not relevant to other prisoners in a certain sense. So um, they are allocated to high security uh, prisoners um, and it still has not been um, implemented that they will be um, um, assembled, but um, the policy of being dispersed is still there, but the understanding that we need to think about a better solution. So maybe, like Orit says, some of them can still be with um, criminals, but the very uh, charismatic ones, the ones that can cause uh, a problem for recruitment and, and, and uh, de-radicalization of other uh, inmates, they are the ones that are being isolated. They are being taken and being isolated from the others. And this is another tactic to uh, first not allow them to recruit other and to um, de-radicalize other, but also to allow them to stay in a place when they can't integrate and you know speak to others and feel like empowered, and that uh, influence th them themselves um, uh, personally uh, in a certain way to to break them and to you know make them realize that it's not a good way to go forward. Um, so it's still. Um, under development, um, and um, we're still hoping that soon um, it will uh, gain more weight in that sense. Um, the Muslim chaplaincy, uh, which is, um, um, there are around 69 full-time, 65 part-time, and 100 seasonal Muslim prison chaplains, which is a big number. Um, about two-thirds follow uh, the Diobandi uh, denomination. She is, is often regarded as a traditional conservative interpretation, which uh, cause some um, uh, cause for um, uh, debate around this thing as well. Um, according to the report, uh, there is evidence of a weak understanding and effective approach to uh, to IE, though most of the imam that works there and most of the people are genuine and people, the hard worker that, you know, does do the job very well, but some of them, 
it seems like can interpret it, it, it differently and can you know work with others um, um, in a very problematic way so there is some need for you know work on that area as well and I think it's very important to realize that and that relates also to to the literature that co goes in, in there and to the ability to monitor that aspects as well um, lesson from other jurisdictions so this report tries to see what's going on in other countries as Netherlands France and Spain and it's very interesting because um, they work quite differently from other jurisdictions and I think I mentioned that to my colleague here from Germany um, in those countries um, i.e. prisoners are more isolated rather than integrated within other uh, other prisoners, which is more uh, relevant to what we are doing here in Israel. Um, but um, the positive aspects and work that is being done in those jurisdictions is that um, there is more um, importance in managing the risk. So these staff are going through um, different trainings and understanding of the culture and, uh, and, and the need for rehabilitation in that sense. Um, but on, I mean, along this, you need also to enhance uh, surveillance and monitoring. So we need to uh, see this approach from both sides. Um, and the police is the one that, um, uh, that in charge of resolving prison-based counterterrorism incidents. So in those countries, um, we definitely in the UK need to learn the, the aspect of how to handle these uh, prisoners uh, differently in isolation, you know, trying to manage the risk and uh, minimize the aspects of recruitment and, and radicalization of other prisoners, uh, which we can see there. I think that from what I've researched and see, um, the aspect of, of the work in other um, jurisdictions in Europe uh, versus the UK, I feel like the UK has some sort of humble um, in understanding that they do need to um, seek to open mind, to, to have some open mind relation to how they handle prisoners, because the IRA was well, is a different era. We need to adjust, we need to develop. Um, and I think that they do want to understand how to manage the threat better. Um, the main recommendations that I um, took on, like here, and I thought that um, are important, um, that there is a need to um, for the isolation and influation, uh, influential, i.e., prisoners um, in specialist unit, giving effective deradicalization interventions. Um, in that sense, of course, you know, the very um, influential ones, the leaders or, or the so-called emirs, um, probably won't really cooperate with any programs of the government or any intervention. They wouldn't want to have anything to do with that. But um, I spoke to quite a few colleagues of mine that says that, you know, after a while being in isolation, they will seek you know, the need for some intervention and will want to cooperate with that. But, I mean, these programs are more to the people that, you know, need this intervention and are more vulnerable and arrive to prison from different um, vulnerable situation. Um, recording of extremist propaganda and threats against staff, again, monitoring these threats um, and use tougher sanctions uh, to enforce you know, these um, aspects. Um, training provided to staff, everything that relates to understanding better the culture, the religion, um, the way to handle these. Uh, I mean, the staff um, in the UK prisons um, have this fear of calling racist or not, you know, being able to understand the culture and do, you know, a lot of um, mistakes due to this um, problem, but training can help, you know, um, um, with this thing. Um, monitor the chaplains, see, you know, the, the literature that goes there, the imams, uh, speak to them, you know, being in the sense that you know who works where and 
how they do it and if they need help, if they need any assistance in uh, working with the other prisoners, then that is a very good approach. Um, and tackling the availability and source of extremist literature, um, not allowing it to go into prison. Um, so that was the report. Um, Andrew Silk, which is a professor at East London University, University that w wrote a, a lot about the radicalization process in prison, he um, wrote a very interesting article about uh, how, uh, you know, about all these efforts um, and attitudes that are trying to tackle and, and in, in prison today. And, and you can see that uh, there is a lot of change from uh, the attitude that previously um, was um, um, approached before. So um, there is a program of religious de-radicalization, um, but this program is no longer valid, uh, which was a very good one. Uh, imams that you know have a more pragmatic and, and um, uh, point of view come inside prison, speaks to the um, to the prisoner, try to tackle the you know um, um, how they think and and and, um, and and the whole understanding. I think my colleague here mentioned that, which is a very good approach. No problem at all. Um, healthy identity intervention. This program works until today. Psychologists, um, uh, social workers are going to prison and you know give answer to the uh, di different deprivations or need of of, uh, of prisoner and the extreme risk guidance 22 uh, plus. It's a really a good aspect because they realize that uh, the assessment that we're doing today for criminals is no longer relevant to terrorists. They need different assessment. So these criteria, and I won't uh, go into detail to now, it's, it's a good assessment that relates specifically to terrorists and, and according to that you can assess them better and find better means to handle them. Okay, I don't have a lot of time to talk about foreign fighters. Uh, but you can see that the numbers have risen uh, from 2000 in, in, two in 2015, 20,000 in 2015 to uh, around th 30,000 in 2016. Um, from the UK, um, it, there are 60,000 from Europe. Um, most fighters leaving Germany, France, and the UK. Um, I will continue. Um, according to the BBC, uh, approximately 850 people from the UK have traveled to support or fight uh, for jihadist organization in Syria and Iraq. This is, these, these numbers, um, according to this, uh, at least half of them have already returned. Um, it's believed that 67 have died and 72 are in prison today, convicted. Others are being monitored or, um, um, yes. The, the last point that I'll make is the motivation of these people. And again, and it's mentioned before, and I think it's very smart, that um, it's not about, you know, very, like we said with Al-Qaeda, very smart people, educated. Today, ISIS received everyone. You know, they recruit everyone. They can be mental ill, personality disordered, not very smart people, or, you know, vice versa, or the other way around. But everyone get accepted. Everyone has a, sp has a place in ISIS, uh, within ISIS, and, and that means that a lot of them has identity crisis, which probably mentioned before, and grievances that can be tackled, can be um, dealt with, and I think it's very important for us to understand that and try to find ways to deal with it. Thank you. Can I suggest that uh, we take the coffee break now? We reconvene at uh, 5 to 5, uh, which will give us an hour uh, for questions and answers. And if you want to ask any of the, uh, the panelists to expand on their presentations, then there's an opportunity to do so then. Thank you. I'm going to start, uh, although uh, Alex has not returned. He was worried that there's some parallel... Um, meeting that uh, 
he thought he was invited to, and he went off to find out whether that indeed was the case. Uh, so uh, we will start. If you have questions, uh, please uh, raise your hand and signify also if it's to one particular person or to the panel as a whole. So, Michael. It's certainly true that um, the rate uh, of, um, of tourism to Syria and Iraq has uh, reduced very dramatically, in fact, by uh, a factor of about four, uh, according to a report earlier this week by Peter Neumann of ICSR King's College. So that means the number of uh, volunteers uh, trying to get there uh, has gone down. Uh, by that very, very large amount. Uh, that's partly because of publicity and, and uh, uh, what is being, you know, what, what the revelations of what's been going on there, but more because Turkey has closed the borders and because uh, it's just not possible, it's just so much more difficult to get there. Um, the... Um, however... However, as you will have heard uh, in some of the sessions yesterday and today, that may not be uh, of such great importance as far as other countries are concerned because it's very apparent now that uh, IS has put in place long-term uh, activists, some possibly going back a year or two, uh, who are being activated as and when it suits the IS directors. Uh, so the, the, uh, the people that have been arrested in Germany in the last few days uh, were part of a network that was being coordinated uh, from Syria, from Raqqa. Uh, it's not yet certain whether the 11 people arrested in the UK in the last few weeks are individual groups or whether they're also part of a, a larger group. Uh, but um, it, it's clear that uh, and we've already heard the messages coming from IS that if you can't get to, 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 to Syria or Iraq, then commit your act of terrorism in your own country. So the fact that the, uh, the, rate, of migra or the rate of travel has reduced very substantially might actually have no real beneficial effect as far as we potential victims are concerned. I would agree uh, to some extent with that, that while this may stop potentially people going there to fight with them, but it is not a solution to the larger problem of radicalization because ra extremism and radicalization has spread its tentacles all over the world. So whether you call, call it Boko Haram or whether you call it the Taliban or whether you call them, call it Hezbollah, it's all over the world and if you, um, oust one part of it, it rises up in another place. So it's not that it is, this is the problem with the virus that, you know, it has spread because uh, it's, it's all over the place now. So, and it's an ideology. You know, what, what has to be done is it's not a war of weapons. And we've seen that. It's a war of ideas and it's a war of ideologies. I think that uh, we've let it hap happen for so long. We've let it grow and prosper for so long that it has become a Frankenstein monster in its uh, own way, what we can possibly do is see that there are not more radicals created, 
because we need to target this ideology now at every level, in every place, and at a very young age. Well, I'll begin with the fact that uh, we haven't done the radicalization process uh, for the terror inmates in Israel yet. The only thing that has been done is regard to the juveniles, because some of them really were not terrorists, but they were captured as throwing stones or things like that. They are being treated in a different way in a special uh, juvenile facility and involving, involving education according to the Israeli law, in, involving um, a little bit of community. Why, they, uh, why we cannot do that with the vast majority of the terrorists is the fact that any rehabilitation process has to do with the community because you, don't, you cannot do a, uh, um, rehabilitation within prison when there is nothing out there for them. As long as the Palestinian Authority does not cooperate in programs, in uh, aftercare programs, in what we call rehabilitation process that go the day beyond being released, nothing would work for them. Uh, so what I uh, offered here was uh, my idea of uh, um, separating them to three subgroups. And I began, after my um, retirement, I began to speak with the Palestinian Authority and the Israelis, trying to do something with the light terrorists, if, if, if at all. Um, we, I, I tried. I didn't succeed. Uh, informally, there isn't the radicalization formally process within the terrorists in Israel prisons, but the juveniles. Uh, Saki, do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I think it's a definitely in the UK, all the aspects of the radicalization, as I was mentioned, is quite a new, a new thing. So there's not too many statistics or knowledge about you know, the lo how large is the success or failure. What I can say is I'll that... I'll comment on that, because you're talking about prisons. You're not talking about channel. I'm talking about prison, yes. Yeah. I, I I'll talk about channel. I want to say something about channel. If you say that, no problem at all. So he will mention channel. This is a different aspect, uh, which is more successful, and, and, and my colleague here will elaborate on that. Uh, within prison, um, as, I mean, as I said, the big, like the charismatic, more influential and, and senior leaders and, and figures don't really want to cooperate with any uh, programs or any initiatives of the government. But the low level ones are more keen and more vulnerable and needed. So the, the, there is more success there. 
and it really depends on the need, on the grievance, and how to approach it, and if it comes from the community as well, and, and so th I think that later on there will be more statistics available, but not at the moment. Alex, did, did you want to say anything on this? I came in only late, for my excuse. I think the Sri Lankan case uh, is uh, valid, but more often than not, uh, the parties have not a clear victory and a defeat, uh, and the peace process comes in uh, between, uh, but this should not be used against uh, attempts uh, to make peace. Uh, after World War II, denazification was uh, easy because there was no will to fight. But after World War I, when Germany thought we have not lost on the front, you had this revenge uh, movement of Nazis was coming up. So uh, in principle, it's nicer, better if you can make a collective uh, de-radicalization than, rather than one individual after uh, the other. Sometimes you can do a collective one in prison. The Egyptians tried it, uh, but uh, with uh, dubious uh, results. Uh, I think it was uh, Zawahiri who said, uh, probably the fax was sent with the same electricity that these peoples had been tortured with, uh, where they s announced a change of uh, heart. So you're right in terms of the victory and decisive defeat, but the price that has to be paid by innocent people, especially in the last phase of the war, uh, has been a very big one, and uh, you have to weight one against the other. Um, there are a couple of points. I think the first thing to say is that de-radicalization's program work if you offer something positive at the other end of that program. Somebody who goes through that program at some point begins to realize that he's going to benefit from being de-radicalized. So there has to be this, this carrot and stick uh, approach, uh, and it works. Uh, it does work, and when I mentioned uh, the panels that we ran here last year, I mean, this was the fifth year I've run this panel, uh, when I spoke about Rohan Gernaratna's uh, work, and I said Malaysia, but he was also running in Sri Lanka, where they were giving former terrorists um, they were providing them with uh, farms, small holdings, and, 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 and uh, animals, and they were setting them up in life in return for de-radicalizing, uh, and they were giving them a, 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 a way to earn the, 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 the way of, uh, the, 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 a means to, to earn a, a living. So there was something positive. Uh, the Saudis, uh, which Shiraz Maher wrote about and did a BBC film for, uh, their program didn't work so well. There they were, because they were Saudis, they were offering them everything. They were giving them a car, a wife, a house, uh, and they would sit in a, essentially a prison camp for a couple of months and go through a process of de-radicalization. But subsequently they found that some of the people that returned to Al-Qaeda were people who'd been through the de-radicalization program. Why that process didn't work in, in, in Saudi, I don't know. But in Northern Europe, some of the programs work. The exit programs run by Germans uh, in Sweden, which were originally focused on the far right, but were also then transferred uh, to deal with jihadis, are working. I sat a couple of years ago on um, like a supervisory panel for the European Commission's Radical Awareness Network, one of their projects. Uh, and it was looking specifically at uh, the Danish and Dutch de-radicalization programs, which I outlined in my, my opening comments. And by and large, those have been very successful, but those are based on uh, bringing the family uh, and supportive environment. Uh, they were based on uh, re-educating people, also providing them with a, a means to earn a living. They were all encompassing. They were very intensive, but they have worked. Um, and I don't know what the success rate is, but the assessment was that generally they were very sick, they were very good. And in fact, Magnus um, uh, uh, Ransdorp, who helped devise the Copenhagen program, which was based on the initial uh, uh, Danish program, um, was talking 
uh, both in our panel and subsequently to me in private, about how successful the Copenhagen model had become, the, the Yahoo spectrum. Um, as far as Channel is concerned, the English de-radicalization program, um, I'll repeat what I said last year, which is I can't talk very much about it, but I've been involved in Channel interventions. Um, and they are very successful indeed. Uh, there you're not dealing with criminals, yet there you're dealing with people who are on the path to being radicalized, and there's an intervention, and the intervention is built around that person's individual needs. So if it's re-education, then that can be provided. If it's uh, a, f a closer family environment or taking out of a, of a difficult family environment, that can also be done. But generally, Channel is, is perceived to have been very successful. I know that elements in the Muslim community, including some Muslim policemen, uh, have been bitterly critical of it. But the general assessment by the police and government is that Channel and Prevent, of which it's a part, uh, have been successful. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I'll leave it at that. Yes, question. If I understood you, you are asking if uh, I believe that there is a possibility to rehabilitate those that I called light terrorists in prison. I would say the, the, the way uh, that I would suggest uh, to deal with them is first of all trying to give them some vocational training so it will give them something to do when they'll come out because otherwise when they come out they will get back into their colleagues again uh, so uh, cooperation I the basic uh, uh, condition is cooperation with the Palestinian Authority that's what I've said they are getting back there if there will be nothing in cooperation with the Palestinian Authority, we will not. We 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 can do something, but I'm not sure it would work later on. The f why I'm saying about the cooperation is because the Palestinian Authority should say yes, we want them to be rehabilitated, meaning we are not uh, glorifying their part in the struggle. This is not so easy to be done, but. On the other hand, I assume, I know a little bit, but it was a few years ago, that they also want to define the terrorists as terrorists and those people who are not. And then that's the only way, as to my opinion, to, to, uh, um, to give them the hope that maybe they will be released in two-thirds what we have here. So vocational training, education led by the Palestinian Authority in the Israeli prisons might be a kind of a potential solution. I'm not sure about it. We have to, to try to do that. First of all, the juvenile. Juvenile, it works a little bit. I don't know how it will happen with these light. I believe that there is a possibility to, to 
uh, work with them, but only with that group. Um, the, um, the charge that Breivik is, uh, is in a holiday camp uh, is understandable, viewed from outside of Norway. But you have to understand uh, the Norwegian prison system uh, is based on rehabilitation. The whole philosophy of the Norwegian prison system is rehabilitation uh, more than punishment. That's why Breivik is, is in the sort of prison that he is. But in fact, he recently sought to challenge his sentence on the grounds that his human rights had been abused. Uh, and it went to court, um, uh, but of course he lost. But I mean, that is the Norwegian uh, attitude. You can contrast that with the American uh, attitude, which is punishment with a very heavy hand. And recently, the Norwegians hosted uh, a study tour by American prison governors uh, to demonstrate how their system seems to work better than that in, in America. Whether it does or not, I'm, I'm not in a position to say, but it was an interesting exercise uh, by the Norwegians to show that the Americans, uh, that their system works passively better than the American system. The Norwegians believe it suits their culture, their environment better. I'm not in a position to judge. I don't know enough. Yes, sir. I have a question to the Can I just stop you? The question is, can there be a universal form of de-radicalization, yes? I had two questions. And the second ah, all right. Question <laughs> <was> <laughs> we got lost. Can de-radicalization <laughs> without understanding theology? Right, OK. Um, I'll, I'll take your second question first. Uh, in the, when we talk about a radicalization, there are all, you know, there are different kinds, as you just said. You know, there's a, there are those based on national interest. You know, there is the white supremacist. That's also a kind of radicalization. You know, there are still neo Nazis that exist. They are radicalized. Work closely with the Islamists, by the way, according to a new FBI report that I just read. But Islamist radicalization is very theology based. It's very different. I don't think that we are have an ability to understand or discuss Islamist radicalization in light of all the other kinds. It is very exclusive in nature. When you have a group of people who embrace death, then 
we're talking about a huge problem for them. It's always a win-win situation. If they're tortured in jail, that's exactly what they're looking for. If they're killed, that's what they're looking for. So you're right. There has to be an aspect of it in which their ideology is debunked with the other narrative ideology. And uh, the Quilliam Foundation that I had mentioned is actually working on a um, alternate narrative theology to what ISIS has produced so they can, uh, so they can challenge them on that ideology which is theological in nature. But at the same time, we can't stop working on the other social issues as well because you know there are many young people who haven't even heard the theology who don't know about it they're just radicalized because they've been taught to hate the other and the only way you can harm another human being is when you are taught to hate them so we have to there are many heads to this in the islamist radical ideology problem we have to target all of them i'd like to to say Please. a few words I would say I told you that I'm going to be the naughty girl of this uh, panel. I'm, I'm going to tell you something uh, about that. I think uh, what is missing is trying to empower, protect, um, encourage the Muslim moderate, and I know that there is a lot of definition to moderate, uh, imams and leaders because they are threatened. They are not uh, uh, coming forward and saying this is not the real meaning of Islam. As long as the European and other countries will not protect them in, in a proactive way and give them the stage and do anything for them to be able to come forward and say loud and clear, this is not what uh, Islam means, it will remain the same, uh, uh, the same thing. Yeah. Meaning, investing in trying to find something that is out of the box because we are doing the same the whole time and it doesn't work very well. It works here and then. That, as to my opinion, will change the game. Uh, that's my opinion. Yes, please. You're best qualified to no. answer. Uh, no, no. <laughs> all, all of the. Listen, this is the only panel where there's a majority of women, so. <laughs> you know, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, we talk about Muslim majority societies and then we talk about Western societies in, when mus in which Muslims have settled. Um, I don't believe we have made much progress because one of the byproducts of radicalization is the oppression of women. And as this has risen, and I can speak of my own country, Pakistan, when I was growing up there, we did not have Islamization that you see there now. We had you know, mixed gender schools, freedom, music, culture, art. In fact, uh, it, it's very interesting to note that in the early 70s, uh, there was the RCD3 three, three really uh, powerful Muslim countries, which was Turkey, Iran, and Pakistan at that time had created the regional uh, cooperation development, which was development in education, art, culture, sciences. And unfortunately, today that has become, you know, the regional uh, cooperation for death and destruction because all of that was put to an end, including women's rights. So when radicalization is allowed to flourish, when fundamental, uh, fundamentalism is on the rise, women's rights always get oppressed. And perhaps in terms of statistics and numbers, the worst example that I can give you is that in two 2015, last year, according to the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, there were three honor killings a day, three a day in Pakistan. So that was uh, an increase from the year before, and it has been on the increase ever since. So, you know, somebody very sensible said that you can judge the progress of a community by the way its women are treated. And in Muslim-majority societies, and the spillover of that is in Europe, 
where uh, due to socio-political conditions, due to rise of fundamentalism, women are being pushed back. So it's uh, definitely, I think, when 50% of the population will be empowered to speak out, there will be a difference. Does anybody else want to comment? Another question. Yes. Uh, I just would like to take issue with the fact that uh, there is a Western approach uh, imposed on uh, Easterners, and we have to understand the theology. Uh, I've been in places like Singapore and uh, seen how these religious de-radicalization programs uh, take place. There's also an element of coercion of it, because the fam family gets punished uh, if they uh, re go back to uh, the bad ways, and that's even more true in uh, Saudi Arabia. But I mean, what unites us as human beings in our values and so is much bigger than these differences. I did once a survey on the 50th anniversary of uh, the Global Declaration of Human Rights, which all Muslim countries except Saudi Arabia with some qualifications, uh, agreed on them. And uh, I looked what are Jews, uh, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, uh, Marxists, and many others have in common. And then I tried to uh, see their answers to what are our human obligations. And there was enormous overlap, and I made a list, uh, which you can find on the internet, Ethics for the New Millennium, 20 Human Obligations. I needed more than the Ten Commandments uh, because <laughs> times have become a bit more complicated. So I would not accept the fact uh, that there is an Eastern solution and a Western solution. Having said that, we in the West try to uh, integrate uh, the person into a community, uh, but when there is no community, then uh, that's the end of it. But in reintegrating them into the religious community, it's difficult in Islam. I mean, there's Sufism, Deobandism, uh, there are four legal schools, and, uh, Shia and Sunni. What is a true Islam? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Gentlemen over here in the blue shirt. You don't have a way out. <laughs> <laughs> the sad part is that we are struggling with this, all of us, and that's why we are having these discussions. If we had the solution, we wouldn't be having this discussion. This is a 21st century phenomena. We have to find a 21st century solution to it. And uh, we just don't have enough discussion and debate amongst the different communities to find a, a common solution. Uh, you know, this, it, the, the the jihadists are radicalized through aspects of the faith. They're not radicalized through a Freudian psychology. Their faith is used to radicalize them. So the same ideology and faith has to be used to de-radicalize them. And therefore, as I had said, we need to go to the grassroots. We need to go to what is being taught in the madrasas. We need to go to where the basic foundation of the teachings are 
And we have to tackle that, and to some extent, we are doing it. it it's a very slow change, it's a very slow process, because as you said so clearly, billions of dollars, millions of people against two pensioners trying to change the world? Seriously? <laughs> but, no, no, but I, no, no, I understand. The, the numbers of people who are fighting this ideology are also growing. This is why we have the reform movement. This is why we encourage people. Because this, by the way, is the most important thing. It is not a Muslim problem. So everybody needs to be involved, and they are involved. You know, This is something that has to be done through science, technology, education, uh, vision, uh, arts, culture, in every, every aspect. This is a global crisis, and we need to deal with it. It's, it you know, it's if you had a uh, SARS virus, the whole world got, gets on board to deal with it. So we need everybody, every angle, uh, you know, those who are within, those who are on the outside, and, but we need to go to the foundation of where this is happening so that another generation of jihadis is not created. That's where we need to put the, the stops. It brings me back to what I've said before uh, regarding the leadership, the, uh, the um, religious leadership, because if you invest so much money in one here and one there to de-radicalize an inmate here or a person there, you are trying to do a lot, but it, the, the results are very uh, small. Yeah. But if you will invest <laughs> that of effort in a global perspective, in these people, the leaders over there, that might make a change. I believe it. I'm op optimistic. I have to be. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Yes, gentleman in the center. Well, I mean, a lot of radicalization is indeed uh, taking a place on uh, the internet. It also connects those who are interested in the topic with real people in the world so that they can actually form cells. But I would say that while radicalization online is possible, de-radicalization online is uh, not possible. It needs the face uh, to uh, face a contact with people and often uh, the person on the other end uh, can uh, transfer values and become a role model for the other. And I think what the world needs is uh, positive role models. Uh, El Nelson Mandela's, uh, Albert Schweitzer's, uh, Shimon Peres, and if you look around how many politicians are there in the world that you look up to and say, yes, I will follow him, most of these guys are negative uh, role models, and, or they are celebrities, sports stars, or so. so as an adolescent, you go through a period of rebellion, and uh, if you cannot identify with your father, which would be the ideal normal identification that you look at role models outside. It can be your teacher, it can be somebody in uh, the community, but you need an identification object so that you can move into the direction and become the person you want to be. And we get a lot of role models by TV, by uh, social media, that are hollow uh, models, uh, pure external shine and uh, no substance. And that creates a certain spiritual void which then uh, religious or pseudo-religious leaders uh, try to fill. So I see part of the problem there. Um, I'll just squeeze in one last question. Okay. Oh, dear. Oh, sorry. 
Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to very quickly add to what you had said. You know, you're absolutely right that the same tools that they're used to radicalize can be used to, to de-radicalize. And for this, I want to refer you very quickly to the Clarion Project, which actually has a tagline of saying, challenging extremism, promoting dialogue. And they are using social media and interviews of um, progress, you know, the, the leadership in the Muslim world to give, while there's also uh, exposing radicals, they're also giving voice at the same time simultaneously to the voices that are bringing about change. The last question. Oh, I thought, sorry. Hello? Okay. Um, I think two points are important in that sense. We mentioned um, ex extremists um, like Majid Nawaz, like uh, Shiraz Maher people that came from there and can understand the rhetoric, can understand you know, the motives, and now preaching against it. And people listen to them because they know what they're saying. There's quite a few of them, uh, Rashad Ali as well. I mean, people that today knows how to speak to these kinds of people and convince them. I just mentioned around 400 people that returned from Syria. I'm sure we can utilize some of them to do this work and it can be used very, I mean, they're looking for empowerment. They're looking for doing something, you know, honorable. And, and, and so I think this is a good way to utilize them in that sense. So, and using Twitter and all the social media, it, th there's a debate whether to shut them down or to use them. There's a lot of intelligence that you can, you know, find there and, and aspire from it. So, I mean, it, it's a problem because they can incentive others, but it's also, being used by intelligence and by organization like ICSR that has been done amazing research about you know foreign fighters just from Twitter, okay? So use that, and I'm sure it can be useful. Uh, the final question, please. Tipping point. Yes, can. And this was a recently published UK parliamentary report looking at just that. At what point can you intervene and successfully de radicalize? It's online, it's a UK parliamentary publication from a few weeks ago. Radicalization, the counter narrative, and identifying the tipping point. Perfect, thank you. Thank you.